What's up guys and welcome back to the channel and on today's video, well today's video of course is the weekly running and training vlog where the main purpose of this video is for you to tell me about your week of running. I want to hear about your successes and I definitely want to hear about those setbacks. But first, before we get into that, before I let you know about my week of running, I did come across an article in Outside Online and the article is titled, There's New Data on How Your Arm Swing Affects Running. Now this article was written by Alex Hutchinson, so as I've said before, anything Alex writes is gold when it comes to running research. And the article was based on a new study that was published in March of 2022, so just a couple months old. And the study asked the question, does restricting arm motion compromise short sprint running performance? Now, most of us, I know we are not sprinters. We are going out there for the long haul, but, but still stay with me. There is value in this study and maybe it'll be surprising to you. Maybe it won't. At the end, I want you to just drop a comment and let me know if this was surprising. But to me, it seems pretty normal to expect that swinging our arms when we're running is going to help with our running, right? It's something we all do. In fact, before I turned on the camera, I did a quick Google search simply titled arm swing when running and I got 48,600,000 results. So clearly there is a lot of information out there about swinging our arms when we're running. With that number of results, you might think that there is something behind it and spoiler, there is. But we'll get into that in just a second. Let's talk about the study. So the study looked at 17 athletes. They used seven track and field athletes and 10 team sport athletes, mostly soccer players. And the title said it enough. They were trying to see if arm swing affected the times of them running short sprints. And in this study, the short sprint was 30 meters. So the researchers had the participants get used to it, you know, have a couple of practice runs because it is not normal to run with your arms not moving. And after they had got used to it, they went out and they ran six 30 meter sprints, three with the arms in just free motion and three with restricted arms. And because they used athletes from different sports, so we've got the track and field and then we've got the team sport athletes, to measure the track and field athletes, they had them start in the blocks when they were able to move their arms normally. The athletes were told to cross their arms across their chest and kind of hold onto their shoulders and that's how they got the restricted arm movement part of the experiment. So the track and field athletes, they were allowed to start in the blocks like they normally would on a race, but when they had their restricted arm movements, they built up blocks and they had the athletes kind of lean over and rest their elbows on the blocks. And obviously that was to mimic the starting position that they're used to when they're doing their normal track events. With the team sport athletes, it was a little different. They don't start in blocks when they're running around. So for the team sport athletes, they did a standing start. Obviously the normal arm swing is just going to be standing there and then starting running. And then they did the same runs again with their arms across their chest, kind of holding onto their shoulders to restrict their arm movement. The results were surprising. But first, I want to know how well you think you would do if you had to sprint 30 meters. So we're talking an all out sprint sprint for 30 meters with your arms clamped across your chest like this. It doesn't seem normal to me. It doesn't seem intuitive that I would be able to run fast. But here are the results. The track athletes were able to cover that 30 meter distance in 4.55 seconds when they were running normally. So that's out of the blocks, boom, they're off 30 minutes, 4.55 seconds. When they had their restricted arm movements, when they had their arms across their chest and their elbows were up on blocks, they were able to cover that distance in 4.63 seconds. Okay, so 4.55 without any restrictions. 4.63 with restricted arms. The team sport athletes who started with a standing start, they were able to run 5.01 seconds when they had no restriction. So they're just starting from standing, then they're running the 30 meters in 5.1 seconds. When their arms were restricted, get this, their times slowed down to 5.08 seconds. I don't know about you, but I find this pretty incredible. So overall, the difference between non-restricted arm movements and restricted arm movements resulted in a slowdown of 1.6%. Now guys, I know, I know when we're talking elite level, when we're talking world-class sprinters, 1.6% is pretty big. But who is also surprised that it's only 1.6%? Now I'm thinking about it, 1.6% sounds bigger than the actual difference in the times. So for the track and field athletes, there was only 0.08 of a second difference between restricted arm movements and not restricted arm movements. For the team sport athletes, there was even less. There was 0.07 seconds difference between when their arms were crossed and not able to swing and when they were able to run and swing their arms freely. 0.07 and 0.08, that is nothing. What do you think? Let me know. Who, who's surprised? This is pretty sensational running science, isn't it? Now, obviously, these are only 30 meter sprints. It's impossible to tell if that could be extended out to a marathon distance. Now I think about it, you know what would be a great experiment? Is if we have someone run a marathon, then we have the same person run the same marathon, but on the second one, we tie their arms to their chest and we give them a pair of carbon plated shoes. And one would think that they would still run faster on the second marathon because the carbon plated shoes promote running economy more so than the crossed arms and the restricted arm movement 
movements actually take away. Wouldn't that be a good experiment? If any of you out there are looking to get your doctorate in sports science, feel free to use that idea. You don't have to give me any credit, just let me know in the comments that you're going to use that idea. So ultimately, this doesn't really change anything, but I think there is one big takeaway. So when we're running and we're swinging our arms left and right, the main purpose of us swinging our arms is to counterbalance our body as we're striding forward. So basically swinging our arms keeps us going in a straight line. It keeps our body facing forward and the side to side motion eliminated or at least reduced. And we've all been told to, to just to run with our arms facing forward and our, and our hands shouldn't come across the center line, right? And that advice probably stems from when our arms come across our center line, it's going to rotate our body just a little too much. So we've established that our arm swings kind of counterbalance our body as we're moving forward. Well, the experiment showed that when the athletes had their arms restricted, their whole torso would move back and forth a lot more. And that increased the torso movement actually replaced the arm swing as far as counterbalancing the body. Now this is the main downside as far as taking this data from a 30 minute sprint and then extrapolating it out to longer distances. Because it seems to me that 30 meters is quite a short amount of distance to run. Whereas you and I and we go out and we run for several kilometers a time. While the running economy may not be reduced that much in the short term, it seems like it would increase exponentially as time goes on. So in a 30 minute sprint, we're not using that much energy. So the increase in energy expenditure from having restricted arm movements is, is negligible. But if you go out and you run for an hour, I'd have to say that it would get pretty tiring pretty quickly if you had to have restricted arm movements. The main takeaway that I'm taking from this article is that if your arm swing is not precise, if you don't look like a beautiful Kenyan runner running down the street every time you lace up, it's okay guys. It's okay. You're still swinging your arms and therefore you are still counterbalancing your body moving forward. If it's not as efficient as it possibly could be, it's okay. The difference in you swinging your arms in the most efficient way and swinging your arms how you might do it right now is pretty small, pretty infinitesimal in fact. So I'm going to take this study as a win because now it is one less thing that I have to worry about. I don't have to worry about swinging my arms in the right way. I can just run without giving that part of my running any more thought. Come to think of it, it's almost like the difference between heel striking and forefoot striking and if you're trying to change to do one from the other. Well, no one would change from a forefoot strike to a heel strike. But the point is, is that some of us are made to run a certain way. Some of us are meant to heel strike. Some of us find it a lot more natural to swing our arms less than others. But I want you to take comfort in that you are doing the best you can do. And if you are comfortable in the running stride that you have, just know that changing it probably isn't worth the hassle. You're not going to be getting these huge gains from making these changes that are possibly going to make you more tired. And with that positive note from science, thank you science, I had a great week of running. A great week because it started off on Monday with a day off from running. Now guys, normally I don't take Monday off, but Monday was a travel day, so I had to wake up very early and drive for several hours in the car. And by the time I got home, to be honest, I just didn't feel like going out for a run. And that's okay. Sometimes it's good to take an unplanned day off. And I know that because I took that Monday off, my Tuesday run was going to be pretty good. And it really was. Tuesday I knocked out a total of 8.1 miles, but I did include six 800 meter repeats with two minutes recovery in between. Now this is my first workout back post Boston Marathon and it actually felt pretty good. It felt pretty good until I got to the last one. Then I really noticed that my legs were getting a bit tired, a bit heavy. And Wednesday, Wednesday was the only day off I had. So I had a little extra time in the morning and I ran a little bit further. I knocked out a total of 13.1 miles, but I did it in two runs. I did a 10 mile run, then I did a 3.1 mile run or a 5k run just to get some extra YouTube filming in. And even though I did separate it into two runs, they were back to back. Like I came home, I changed my shoes, I went out again. Thursday was another workout day. I knocked out 11 miles total, but during those 11 miles, I did five miles at tempo pace. And I was testing a pair of shoes and you'll probably see that review coming later in the week. And then after Thursday's workout, the rest of the week were pretty much easy runs. Friday was 7.2 miles, very easy. Saturday was 7.6 miles, very easy. Sunday was 7.7 .7 miles, very easy. But this this time I did run over to the mall and I ran up and down the car park in the mall. And that brought my week's total to 54.78 miles, which is around 88 kilometers. So pretty good week. I have been feeling a bit tired this week. Not sleepy, tired, just like tired of running. My legs have been feeling really heavy and I'm sure that is just some residual fatigue from the Boston Marathon a couple of weeks ago. Hi right, guys, don't forget to let me know about your week of running, successes and setbacks. Thanks for staying all the way to the end of the video. Be kind, be happy, run well. I'll see you in a couple of days.